Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alistair Cook. One of my jobs, in fact my main job, is that of Chief American Correspondent of the Manchester Guardian, a British daily newspaper that takes a continuous interest in international affairs, of course, but also takes a passionate interest in the arts. Now, I think this is a fair division because politics is the movement of a nation's life, but the arts are the visible record of it. I am proud to say that in the course of my work, I have driven around the United States 27 times. And what I have to say now is about Virginia, a state that I enjoy for many reasons. For one thing, for that first brilliant generation of Virginians that founded the Republic and guided its first steps. But the Virginians keep the memory of these men green in more living ways by bringing to all Americans what that first generation gave to the first Americans. For instance, on a recent tour of Virginia, on the highway I came across a most extraordinary trailer truck. And it led me to an art institution that is unique in the United States. Now I'd like to tell you about it. I was on my way to Tidewater, Virginia, when we first passed the big trailer, which on close inspection had a sign on it reading Art Museum. This monster aroused my curiosity. What was inside it? Where did it come from? I was still wondering long after we left it behind. The next day, I met the big truck again, or one just like it, at Jamestown, where you can see replicas of the ships that brought the first English colonists to settle on American soil. This time our paths crossed, for the trailer was heading south by the same ferry that had just brought me north from the town of Scotland, named for King James's homeland, on the other side of the James River. From the James, I went on to Williamsburg, the colony's 18th century capital, whose scrupulous restoration was the result of a munificent grant by the late John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Of the great men who shaped the American heritage, none ranks higher in the affections of Virginians than Robert E. Lee. Lee's home in Arlington is now a place of pilgrimage for Northerners and Southerners alike. It reminds us too of Virginia's strong influence on the architecture of the early United States, particularly in spreading the Greek revival style. Jefferson's state capital at Richmond was copied from the Maison Carré at Nîmes in southern France. Its statue of Washington by the Frenchman Houdon again recalls Virginia's leadership of the young nation. On the street in Richmond, an invitation to join and enjoy the Virginia Museum caught my eye, reminding me once more of the art museum truck I'd seen. Could there be a connection? Go to Grove Avenue and Boulevard, somebody said. Richmond seemed very much aware of the museum. Look for a modern Georgian building with plenty of parking space, and out front there's a row of flags flying. You'll always find something going on there. I telephoned the director, a gracious gentleman named Leslie Cheek Jr., and told him about the truck I'd seen labeled Art Museum. Had it anything to do with his outfit? Indeed it had, he said. And what's inside it, I asked, a stuffed whale? Mr. Cheek laughed. Come over and see what we do have, he said. Come and see our museum in action. Well now, who pays for the running of the museum? The museum receives about a third of its income from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And in return for this, you might say, it has a mandate to promote education in the arts throughout the state. You mean all the arts? Yes, all the arts, and for all Virginians. We believe that our urgent job is to make enjoyment of the arts available to more Virginians everywhere. Well, that's, that's quite a strenuous undertaking, and I should think quite a challenge. We think so, Mr. Cook, and I hope you will after you've seen what we're doing. A visitor to the Virginia Museum ascends a broad staircase to the main gallery floor, which is dominated by the central medieval hall and its display of banners, tapestries, and armor. In an adjacent gallery, an out-of-town women's club was being briefed on the background of a rare piece of sculpture that has recently been acquired by the museum, a Hellenistic sarcophagus from Asia Minor. 
The Virginia Museum aims to make learning a personal experience. For one thing, it makes a direct appeal to local loyalties. Showing oil paintings and wood sculpture done by Virginia school teachers, it believes to be part of its function as the art center of the state. Virginia can boast a thriving crop of contemporary artists, and the museum encourages them not only by displays, but also, when it can, by acquiring representative works for its permanent collection. Since colonial times, Virginians have decorated their houses with works by their own contemporaries, and some of the best of these are now in the museum's collection. Several galleries are equipped with the Lectour, a tiny radio receiver which plays over to the spectator, recorded interpretations of works within his view. It's especially welcome here in the French gallery, where the display covers so much ground. Near a scene by Géricault, for instance, hangs Woman with a Kerchief by Picasso. Here's Le Logneur by Watteau, in the romantic taste of the early 18th century. Similar in theme, but more realistic, is Molinaire's 17th century A Musical Party in the Dutch Gallery. Nearby hangs one of the most popular paintings in the museum, from the celebrated Laughing Boy series of Franz Hals. Hals' great Flemish contemporary, Rubens, is represented by the mythological Palace and Arachne. The English Gallery contains several Reynoldses and Rumneys. At all times, the picture collection is under the care of a trained custodial staff, headed by the curator of paintings, Mr. Pinkney Near. The command post of the museum is Director Cheek's pleasant office, where he meets daily with his staff to plan their numerous and varied activities. Among his chief advisors are Muriel Christensen, the associate director, and the business manager, William J. Rhodes, Jr. There's very little formality at these meetings, as you might expect in so young and vigorous an institution. In bringing Virginians into constant and active appreciation of the arts, the museum's theater wing plays a vital role. Only a handful of other museums have a division entirely devoted to the performing arts, and few of them can boast a program comparable in scope to that which the museum's producer director, Robert S. Telford, puts on each year. It's complicated enough to mount just one full-scale drama production in an eight-month season. They put on five. New costumes, for instance, have to be designed for each show. So must the sets. The museum theater's success in this respect owes much to the professionals on its staff. The players, on the other hand, are all amateurs, at least they're unpaid. Under sympathetic direction, however, they have an opportunity to become professionals in all but name. It's a hard, tiring grind, but very exciting to young hopefuls who are willing to put in long hours learning their craft, and, if need be, to pitch in in other ways. Once every year, on this occasion in the midst of one of Richmond's rare falls of snow, comes the time when young men and women converge on the museum from all over the state. This event is the annual College Drama Festival of Virginia. The snow may slow up local traffic, but from colleges far and near, trucks carrying props and scenery arrive right on schedule. This time, the drama groups of nine Virginia colleges take part in the festival, each presenting a short play of its own choosing. While the sets are being installed, the girls of the Sweetbriar Club, Paint and Patches, run through a scene of, I should guess, strong emotional tension. A lighter note is struck in a piece of comic allegory, done in the manner of Commedia dell'arte by the Stratford players of Madison College. Other college groups represented are from Hollins, Longwood, Lynchburg, Mary Baldwin, Mary Washington, and the University of Richmond. The Radford College group chose a tragedy of the Irish Renaissance. At intervals throughout the day-long festival program, the players can chat with such famous guests as Mark Connolly, the author of Green Pastures, and of many another well-remembered play and musical.
Later on, the young actors and actresses will listen with keen interest to an analysis of their work by Henry Hughes, drama critic of the Saturday Review and this year's festival critic. From time to time, the auditorium becomes the scene of a concert staged by the Virginia Chamber Music Society, or a dance recital, or the showing of a movie masterpiece in the film series. The subject that comes up very often for discussion at the daily staff conference is that of special loan exhibitions, the chief responsibility for which rests with John Koenig, the design consultant. It is part of his job to plan the installation of each display down to the last detail. The museum is justifiably proud of its ingenious placing and dramatic lighting. This particular exhibition will present the work of a brilliant architect, Austrian-born Richard Neutra, one of the earliest exponents of the modern international style. It's no surprise to the Virginia Museum staff that its public includes a large number of family visitors, along with students and fine arts enthusiasts. For the museum continually tries to enlist the participation of all Virginians of all ages. The children's art classes are highly popular with the boys and girls, with parents too. And often it's the cultural opportunity the museum offers their children that prompts the parents themselves to join. Once they have joined, they are apt to take advantage of the various classes for adults. But beside the workshops in sculpture, painting and ceramics, the museum offers a host of other facilities and activities. Cultural services for the whole of Virginia are constantly in the director's minds. It is this aspect that, I believe, makes the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts unique. A packaged art show, some 20 original paintings, is only one of over 80 traveling displays that the museum circulates to schools, colleges, clubs, libraries, and art centers in all parts of the state. So heavy is the demand that borrowers submit their requests months in advance, and the task of handling the flow in and out of Richmond keeps a team of packers and technicians busy all the time. Most exhibitions go by truck or train, but a station wagon is sent to fetch this precious cargo, bound for Norfolk, for a college library. The crates are unloaded and the pictures unpacked as soon as the station wagon reaches its destination, the Norfolk Division of William and Mary College, whose new library building is itself an impressive example of contemporary architecture. Since the Norfolk branch, like its parent in Williamsburg, is a group member of the museum, it will only have to pay transportation costs for the right to keep the exhibition for two weeks. Altogether, about 200 non-profit institutions throughout Virginia are now group members. Due east of Norfolk, at a sunny, sandy playground along the Atlantic shore, Another group member, the Virginia Beach Art Association, plays host each summer to part-time and full-time artists who come to the resort for the big open-air art show. Their works are for sale, of course, but the display itself is as free as the sea and sun, and almost as much of an attraction. Recognizing the importance of the Virginia Beach event and others like it, the museum has sent its curator of paintings to be one of the judges. The judging is the high point of the show, and the curator's presence on the panel of judges is at once a sign of the museum's concern for all art activity in the state and its lively desire to keep in touch with Virginia artists and their work. To the museum's loan gallery, with its growing collection of paintings, prints, and sculptures, come members who want to borrow a single item for display. Also available to group members at a modest rental are a number of visual aids, including slide sets, film strips, and films. 
The museum recently strengthened its statewide network by affiliation with existing art organizations whose members become automatically members of the Virginia Museum. In some towns where no art groups existed, the museum has organized chapters which will eventually have affiliate status. Exchanges of materials began as soon as the system was inaugurated. This specially arranged exhibition, for instance, is on its way to an affiliated gallery in Williamsburg. The restored city is, of course, one big museum of 18th century American life and art. To its Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller collection of 19th century folk art has now been added a showplace for the art of our times to bring Williamsburg residents a complete range of cultural enjoyment. Encouraged by the warm reception given their enterprise, the leading spirits of Williamsburg's 20th century gallery have proceeded steadily towards their goal. Affiliation with the Virginia Museum has enabled them to present a fine series of new exhibitions. Wherever they go in Virginia, these contemporary American paintings, most of which would be classified as works of abstract expressionism, never fail to find an audience which almost invariably reacts to them with considerable passion. Some people are excited by them, others are bewildered, or even hostile, but few gallery goers remain indifferent to their challenge. At least the pictures excite discussion, and even the small fry get into the act. In the end, we have to agree on one thing, the painting's ability to arouse thought and feeling. But all art has such power, and the museum seeks to expose as many Virginians as it can, as often as it can, to this profound experience. Thus, to Charlottesville goes one of the two big trailer trucks, or artmobiles, as I've now learned to call them, like the one I'd seen on the road. The automobiles usually stop at remote communities that have no gallery or museum. But today, its destination is the home of the University of Virginia, the finest, perhaps, of all the many memorials to its great founder, Thomas Jefferson. In a few simple operations, quickly done by a couple of men, the remarkable rolling automobile takes its place on the campus as a stationary public gallery. It will stay here for three days. During that time, it will be visited by a thousand or more Virginians. Many will be members of groups who arrange their visits well in advance and received appointments which allowed time for unhurried study of the automobile's contents. The first visitors are a class from a nearby grade school. Then it's the turn of high school students taking a fine arts course. It will be quite a change for them to see actual original paintings instead of slides. As you see, there's a surprising amount of room inside the automobile, and the visitors, normally allowed through at the rate of about 15 every quarter of an hour, can study the Italian Renaissance works at their leisure. Their effect on people of all ages and both sexes is much the same. A kind of awe in the presence of undying line and color, painted by masters dead perhaps these five or six hundred years. This automobile is no ordinary museum, and as evening falls, its doors are still open to receive the public. They come on, the very young and the very old, the adolescents and the middle-aged, and all those in between. Why do they come? Some, no doubt, out of curiosity, some through desire to learn, and some for purely social reasons. But no matter why they come, they all go away enriched. Pioneered by the Virginia Museum, the automobile has proved its worth many times over as a means for promoting art education throughout the Commonwealth. But I still had a few more questions to ask Mr. Leslie Cheek, Jr. I'd like to uh, ask you a rather fundamental question. What do you conceive the function of a museum to be? 
Well, many museums, Mr. Cook, still are primarily great collections of art. The European collections especially, I think. Yes, like the Louvre and Prado yes. and the National Gallery. And uh, the pictures, the great pictures in there, stay there most of the time. Mm -hmm. In America, we think that we should have a more active responsibility for our museums. And our museum in Virginia, though it's only 25 years old, has pioneered in this work of trying to bring the art out of the museum and more to, to the, the people. To the people, that's right. Well, do you uh, then regard yourselves as a happy result of the so-called cultural explosion? I don't know whether it's so happy, but at least we recognize that we are part of the explosion. Mm -hmm. We also recognize the fact that we, that the performing arts are part of our work, and in our theater, which I think is considered one of the finest in the South, we do have music and dance and uh, drama integrated with our other activities in the museum. So we, we are really are a center of cultural activities. At the museum, something seems to be astir in the theater wing. By day, instead of young actors and actresses in rehearsal clothes, there's a stream of citizens approaching the place. They're heading for the box office. Tickets, 10% off to members, are in short supply for the big show. And now that the night of nights is finally here, the testing time of many weeks' hard work, there is all the tension of a Broadway opening. Having made his final check with everyone, the stage manager gives his cue. the curtain goes up on the museum's most ambitious production of the year, which involves a cast of several dozens of players and a small army of technical assistants. Very seldom do amateur companies attempt musical plays of this size, and with good reason. But here there's adequate stage equipment to allow all sorts of producers' dreams to come true. The heroine is beguiling, and the hero is beguiled and delivers his amorous catechism with suitable ardor, while the orchestra, all of them amateurs, provides the background for an evening of illusion. goers make their way from the theater up the grand staircase to the gallery floor. They will have a half hour or so in which to relax by candlelight and chat with friends between the acts. Some people may want to look in on the fabulous Pratt collection of Imperial Russian jewels, probably the most popular of the museum's year-round exhibitions. It includes gem-encrusted Easter eggs, icons and jeweled flowers, part of the treasure hoard created by Karl Faberge, jeweler to the Tsars. Besides ancient sculpture, the Oriental Gallery features delicate porcelain and jade. And before the second act is called, there might still be time to glance at the display of pre-Columbian arts. Loan exhibitions are held regularly at the museum, the previews are gala affairs, often attended by distinguished guests who come long distances for the occasion. Horse-loving Virginia is an ideal climate for this display of sporting paintings of three centuries and from several nations. And Richmond is near enough to Washington to allow the attendance of two busy diplomats, the French and British ambassadors. For Leslie Cheek, each museum day is filled with the challenge of his objective, to acquire, preserve, and present the finest examples of mankind's culture in order to enrich the lives of Virginians. 
such an ideal can never be fully attained by any institution. But this one, with the backing of its generous patrons, an understanding state government, and an enthusiastic group of trustees, is going to keep on trying. Meanwhile, Virginians can take pride in what has already been achieved. Their museum today has won the solid respect of art scholars as a center for the study of man's continual quest for self-expression through the arts. As its collections increase and as the museum expands its work and its functions, more and more groups and more and more individuals throughout Virginia continue to join it. And these members, these many Virginians who have joined their state's museum of art, are now enjoying it in an atmosphere worthy of the best traditions of hospitality in the Old Dominion. Well, that's the story that began for me when I saw my first artmobile on the highways of Virginia. The young Virginia Museum of Fine Arts has pioneered in many fields. It has been ahead of its times, but it's also very much in tune with its times. And when it says to people, join and enjoy, it is speaking to a receptive America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Alistair Cook. Until we meet again, preferably in Virginia.